Chapter 9 of Alcatraz by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Stampede. The Gray Mayor made no effort to draw away when Alcatraz sprinted up beside her. She gave him not so much as a toss of the head or a swish of the tail, but kept her gaze on the far western mountains, for she was still sick with the scent of blood, and she maintained a purposeful, steady lope. It was far other with the stallion. He kept at her side with his gliding canter, but he was not thinking of the peace and the shelter from man which they might find in the blue valleys of yonder mountains. His mind was back at the slaughter of Mingo Lake, hearing the crack of the rifles and seeing his comrades fall and die. It was nothing that he had known the band only since morning. They were his kind, they were his people. They had accepted his rule, and now he was empty-hearted, a king without a people. The gray mare, the fleetest and wisest of them all, remained, but she was only a reminder of his vanished glory. Remembering how Cordova had been served, might he not find a way of harming those men even as they had harmed him? He slackened to a trot and finally halted. His companion kept on until he neighed. Then she came obediently enough, but swinging her head up and down to indicate her intense disapproval of this halt. When Alcatraz actually started back towards the place where the cowpunchers had dropped the pursuit, she threw herself across his way, striving to turn him with bared teeth and flirting heels. He merely kept a weaving course to avoid her, his head high and his ears back, which was a manner the mare had never seen in him before. She could only tell that she was less than nothing to him. Once she strove to draw back by running a little distance west and then turning and calling him, but her whinny made him not so much as shake his head. At length she surrendered and sullenly took up his trail. He roved swiftly across the hollows. He sneaked up to every commanding rise, as though he feared the guns of men might be just beyond the crest, and these tactics continued until they came in view of a small row of black figures riding against the sunset. The gray halted at once, rearing and snorting, for the sight brought again that hateful smell of blood. But her leader moved quietly after the cowpunchers. He was taking the man trail. It was arduous work, frisking from one point of vantage to another, never knowing when the great enemy might turn. They could make death speak from the distance of half a mile. Under shelter of the hills, they might even double back to close range. They might be luring him by the pretense that he was unseen. In such maneuvers, the mare was a dangerous encumbrance. For though she had fallen into the spirit of the thing at once, and never uttered even the faintest whinny, yet it would be far easier for the men to hear and see two than to detect one. Alcatraz strove to drive her back sometimes whirling with teeth bared and rushing at her, sometimes half-rearing as though to strike. But on such occasions she merely stopped and regarded him with eyes of mild amazement. She knew perfectly that he would never touch her with tooth or hoof. She also knew that this was dangerous folly, this badgering of terrible man. But since Alcatraz was not wise enough to follow her, she must even follow him in spite of his folly. She stayed half a dozen lengths in the rear, trembling with excitement, for now they passed the verge of the desert, and now they entered a man-made road bordered with shining fences of men. What retreat was there if men closed in from the front and rear? Yet she went on with dainty and uneasy steps. As for Alcatraz, he pressed up boldly close to the riders, for now the twilight grew thick and it was hard to make out the glimmering forms before him. Twice he paused, twice he went on. There was no real purpose in this following. He dared not come too close, and yet he hoped to harm them. He continued, 
wrung by a confusion of dreads and desires. He was beset with signs of man even in the darkness. Over the well-watered fields of the ranch he heard the lowing of cattle, and now and again the chorus of sheep in a nearby pasture land was reawakened when the bell of the leader tinkled. They were all hateful sounds to Alcatraz, and every step he made seemed to consign him the more definitely to the power of the great enemy. In spite of his boldness, he lost sight of the riders among the deeper shadows of the ranch buildings, and he stopped again to consider. The gray mare came beside him and begged him back with a call softer than a whisper, but he merely raised his head the higher and stared at the huge outlines of the sheds and barns. To Alcatraz, every one of them was a fortress filled with danger that might leap up at him. Yet he must not turn back after having come all this distance, surely. He went on. The road opened into an unfenced semicircle with corrals on every side, and from one of these enclosures a horse neighed, and there was a brief sound of many trampling feet. Some of his own kind were playing there. Alcatraz forgot his hatred a little, forgot man. He went straight to the corral and put his head over the top bar. Snorting softly, curious and frightened at once, six beautiful animals came towards him. He was one of their kind, so they came close. The scent of the wildness was already on him, and they shrank away. Surely some sinister genius had directed Alcatraz to one of the most valuable points of attack on all the ranch, for these were the six brood mares, for whose purchase Marianne Jordan had cleaned out her bank account. The stallion did not know, of course. He did not even recognize them as his competitors in the race. All he felt was that there was something charmingly remembered, something half familiar about them. The boldest came near, and he touched noses, whereat she whirled with a little squeal and lashed out at him. But her heels were carefully aimed wide at the mark, and Alcatraz merely tossed his nose. Plainly, she was a flirt. He pressed a little closer to the fence and urged friendliness with a conversational whinny. They were not averse, coming towards him with eyes that glimmered in the darkness, retreating often and coming on again, until he had touched noses with them all. It was extremely pleasant to Alcatraz, and hardly less so, because the gray mare came and shouldered him rudely. Then a voice spoke from the barn, which opened off the corral. "'What's all that damned nonsense with the mares yonder?' Alcatraz crouched for flight. Another voice answered, "'They'll mill around every night for a while till they get used to the new place.' That's the way with them crazy hot bloods. No horse sense. The voices departed. The shrinking of the stallion had made the mayors wince away in turn, but they came back now and resumed the conversation where it had been broken off. He was careful to introduce himself to each one. He was greatly tempted to jump the fence and talk to them at closer hand, but he knew that it was a great folly to risk his neck in a group of mares before he had made out whether or not they were amiable. If they were cross-tempered, he might be kicked to death before he could escape. The investigations brought entirely favorable returns. They were very young, these Coles horses, and hence their curiosity was far stronger than their timidity. Before long, every one of the six necks was stretched across the top rail, and when Alcatraz turned his back on them, they whinnied uneasily to call him back. If that were the case, why did they not jump? He went back and showed them how simple it was if they really wanted to escape and come out with him into the wind and under the free stars of the mountains. Such a fence was nothing to that powerful jumper. He walked calmly to it, reared, and sailed over. That sent the mares scampering wildly here and there about the corral, and though they came back again after a time, 
they seemed to have learned nothing. When he jumped out again, not one of them followed. Alcatraz stood off and eyed them in disgust. When he was a yearling, he felt he had known more than those big, stupid, beautiful creatures. But plainly, they wanted to get out with him. A wild horse is to the tame what the adventurous traveler is to the quiet man who builds a home. And from the gray mare in Alcatraz, the six were learning many things. The scent of the open desert was on them. The sweat of hard running had dried on their hides. Their heads were recklessly proud. And this tall stallion jumped the fence as though there had never been men who made laws which well-trained horses must not transgress. Plainly, he wanted them to come out. They were very willing to go for a romp, but they knew nothing about jumping as yet, and all they could do was to show their eagerness to be out for a run by milling up and down the fence. If that were the case, there were other ways of opening corrals, and Alcatraz knew them all. He tried the fence with his shoulder, leaning all his weight. More than once he had smashed time-rotted fences in this manner, but he found that these posts were new and well-tamped, and the boards were strongly nailed. He gave up that effort and went about looking for a gate. Gates were not hard to find. A gate is that part of a fence under which many tracks and many scents go. It is also a section which swings a little and rattles annoyingly in a wind. Upon the top board of that section there is sure to be the thick scent of man where his hands have fallen. Alcatraz found the gate. Under the weight of his shoulder it creaked but did not give. He took the top rail in his teeth while the mares stood back, wandering in a high-headed semicircle, and the gray kept nudging at his flank, saying very plainly, Enough of this nonsense. These gangling creatures, all legs and foolishness, are not of our kind. Oh, my master, let us be gone. But Alcatraz heeded her not. He shook the gate back and forth. There are three kinds of fastenings for corral gates. One of them squeaks and strains when it is pulled against. It is made of wire that leaves a bitter taste of iron and rust in the mouth when it is touched. Wire is often very difficult, but with teeth and prehensile upper lip it may usually be worked up high. Finally, it will fall over the top of one of the posts with a rattle, and then the gate is open. Another kind of fastening rattles very much when the gate is shaken. This means that a loose board unites gate and post, running in a slot, and the only way to handle such a gate is to take the loose board by the end and draw it back as far as possible. Then the gate always swings open of its own accord. There is a third kind of fastening. Manuel Cordova used it. It consists of a padlock and chain. Where this is found, one had better leave the cursed thing untried, for it will never be broken or removed. By the first shake of the gate and the corresponding rattle, Alcatraz knew that the sliding board fastened it. He sniffed for it and found it very easily, for always the latch board is one of the heaviest with a man scent. He found it and worked it easily back. It caught on a nail. He tugged again, and as he tugged he quivered at the sound of a human voice and shrank as though the familiar whip of Cordova had cut him. "'They're a little restless tonight, but aren't they dears, Shorty?' queried Marianne. Kind of dear, said the cowpuncher, but maybe they're worth the price. For all his surliness, however, Shorty was her best ally. Wait till you see Lady Mary begin to. But isn't that a horse beyond the corral, a gray horse? I think it is, but it can't be. Why not? There isn't a gray horse on the ranch, and, oh, for the gate of the corral creaked and then swung wide. They could not see Alcatraz, for the bay mares stood between. "'Don't move, don't speak,' whispered the girl. "'It's that stupid Lucas man. I told Lee Hervey that he was too careless to take care of the mares, and the first thing he's done is leave the gate unlatched. 
I'll steal around and... At the first sound of the voice, the gray mare had drifted deeper into the safety of the night. Alcatraz, with a careful effort, pulled open the gate, and the wind aiding him blew it wide, and now the soft whinny of invitation to the mares cut into the words of Marianne. She went around the corral, bending low, skulking in her run, for once the mares got out the gate, they might bolt like crazy things and come to harm in the murderous barbed wire fences. Shorty was hurrying around on the other side. Before she had taken half a dozen steps, the neigh of the stallion, definitely loud, brought her to a halt with her hands clasped. She saw the mares start under the alarm, call and rush for the gate. In a moment, their hoofs were volleying down the road, and the wail of Marianne went shrilling, "'Lee Hervey, Lee Hervey, they're gone!' Lee Hervey in the bunkhouse pushed away his cards and rose with a curse. "'That's what comes of working for a woman,' he growled. "'No peace, no rest. Work day and night. And if you ain't kept working, you're just kept worried. It's hell.' He clumped to the door and cast it open. "'Well,' he called into the darkness. "'Everyone out,' cried Marianne. "'The mares have broken through the gate and stampeded.' End of chapter 9